Just ahead on American Black Journal, independent filmmakers from around the world are coming to Detroit for the Trinity International Film Festival. We'll get the details on this exciting event. Plus, a Detroit artist uses her experiences as an African-American woman as the inspiration for her work. Stay right there. American Black Journal starts now. American Black Journal is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Welcome to American Black Journal, I'm Stephen Henderson. The 12th annual Trinity International Film Festival takes place in Detroit next month and it's going to showcase 70 films from 17 countries. This year's theme is film, music and fashion and there will be several events in addition to the film screenings including panel discussions, exhibits and a fashion show. One of the films at the festival is a documentary about Detroit civil rights icon Rosa Parks. It reveals a side of Mrs. Parks that few people knew except for her family and close friends. Here's a preview. Who was the real Rosa Parks? Rosa Parks was reserved, but she was fierce. She was a seamstress. She, um, at the time when she made her heroic stand, she's working at a Montgomery Fair department store um, as an assistant tailor. It is a segregated department store. Uh, which means that black people can shop there, but they can't try on clothes. So she's working in the men's shop. That means she's tailoring clothes for white men. So I think it's, it's both to complicate all the things we know about her um, and to see, and, and again, the title of my book is taken from a quote from her. She t describes having a life history of being rebellious um, that begins as a child and that continues to her death. As a child, she would have a close relationship with her first cousins that would continue until her death. Rosa Parks and my father was first cousin and her brother, you know, Sylvester, and my father's siblings. They was first cousins, but they was brought up like brothers and sisters. It was a very close-knit family. The night the phone call came, I got my father up and I can remember him telling her, I'll go to the bank to tomorrow, to tomorrow, and we have to get them out of there. And Rosa's activism wouldn't be left in the South. They moved to Detroit, um, where her uh, brother and cousins are living in 1957. And they moved there uh, basically because in some sense they're forced to. Um, she loses her job five weeks into the boycott. Her husband um, is forced to give up his job shortly thereafter. So they spend most of the boycott year without steady work and they're still getting death threats, credible death threats. And so in August of 1957, this is eight months after the boycott ends, they leave Montgomery for Detroit. And while certain public signs of segregation are thankfully gone, 
the systems of school and housing segregation, of job discrimination, of police abuse that she thought she'd left in Montgomery, she finds again in Detroit. So she will set about alongside sort of activists in Detroit sort of to challenge the racism of the Jim Crow North. My Life with Rosie, an exploration of Carolyn Green's quest to preserve the public service legacy of Rosa Parks in the city of Detroit, where Rosa Parks spends the rest of her life fighting injustice with the love and support of her family. Mrs. Parks' cousin, Carolyn Williamson Green, is my guest today, along with Marcelle Montgomery Favors, who's director of the Trinity International Film Festival, Detroit filmmaker Zachary Cunningham, whose short film Little Church is premiering at the festival, and Evan Franklin, who is the lead actor in Little Church. Welcome, all of you, to American Black Journal. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I want to start with you, uh, because we were just watching clips of that film. Uh, that, that it's an extraordinary uh, story uh, to sort of look behind the headlines and the, the sort of media stories that we know about Rosa Parks to see what her family was like. And you are a member of that family. Tell, tell me what that was like. Well, she wasn't Rosa Parks. <laughs> the icon. <laughs> right. Uh, yes. Right. She, she was, was Rosa Parks, your cousin. Auntie Rosie. <laughs> right. <laughs> or Rosie. Mm -hmm. That's what she's called by family members. Mm -hmm. Which I call her Rosie. My children call her Auntie Rosie. Mm -hmm. And um, she was just Rosa Parks. You know, she come over all the time. <laughs> <laughs> almost every Sunday, uh -huh. get a meal, mm -hmm. go home, you know. Where them, me and my husband sometimes was out. Yeah. And we get home, the children would say, Auntie Rosie came over, she left you a note. <laughs> and, you know, to thanking me for the food. Yeah. And uh, but like I say, she never missed a graduation, wedding. Mm -hmm. where, I, she didn't care where it was at. <laughs> All right. She uh, made it her business to attend. So, like I said, she was... Me and her had a good relationship. Yeah, yeah. and it from, sounds from like the time, even yeah. from the film. And she would always tell me I look like my aunt. Yeah, yeah. That wow. she would, they was like sisters. Yeah. So that's really. I don't know if that was it. Then my son was born December the first, so that made it even closer. <laughs> right, right. So, um, huh. yeah. like I said, was she was just. Auntie Rosie. Just a member of the yeah, family. Yeah, just a member yeah. of the family. Yeah, it's it's really incredible that you guys have this film as part of the festival, uh, but each year you surprise and delight people, I think, with the, with the films you're able to get to, to, to show here. I, I, I appreciate that. You yeah. know, it's, it's definitely growing, and even um, uh, this year, as you mentioned, you know, we have 70 films from 17 different countries, mm -hmm. uh, but as well, you know, we also highlight our D, uh, Detroit films as well, so we have 25 uh, Detroit filmmakers that yeah. are part of this festival. Yeah. Uh, go back to the beginning for us, uh, the Trinity uh, International Film Festival. Where did you get the idea for it? What were those early years ah. like? <laughs> so as a filmmaker myself, it mm -hmm. was um, myself and... Um, uh, Janae and Rocky Black, we were all filmmakers, and we were constantly traveling to other film festivals mm -hmm. and um, and networking and having a great experience, and we thought, um, that what could that look like in Detroit? Yeah. And so that's how the festival came about. Yeah, yeah, uh, and it's grown mm -hmm. each year. I mean, each year yes. we talk with you, Absolutely. it's and bigger. This, and, and now <laughs> I do it with my husband, Lazar Favors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tell us about Little Church. You were here last year. Yes, sir. For the festival, and I won't remember the name of the film that you better uh, run. You better run, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, Little Church. What is that film about? So, Little Church is about a ten-year-old preacher's kid. Mm -hmm. I'm a preacher's kid myself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, he's trying to connect with his father, dealing with a little bit of anxiety and things of that nature. Um, and it's starring this young man, Evan Franklin, uh -huh. who does an absolutely phenomenal He's job. He's playing you, essentially, well, right? Well, uh, it's, <laughs> no? it's loosely, it's kind of inspired right? by my childhood. Right? So, um, um, not exactly me. Yeah. yeah. What, uh, what, what's the thing that you want people to take away from this film? Uh, I think the thing that people will take away is that um, there are certain things that happen as as children to mm -hmm. you as, as a child that mm -hmm affects you when you get older. Yeah. So I think at the end of the film, everybody will look back and be like, wow, yeah. that, you know, it, it kind of has that effect when you right. watch the film. Right, right. So Evan, tell us about being the star 
of that film? <laughs> well, for one, it was kind of really my first time being a star of any film. Yeah. And it was it was fun, but I had to I had to work harder than usually. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, I definitely gained a lot of experience, knowledge, and relationships with yeah. my cast members. How, how long have you been acting? Um, pretty well. So, uh, since about I was, I was either four or three. Okay. I believe. So you were I, really little when you started. Yeah, yeah. This. And and, I, and do you like it? Do you like uh, working on films and other other acting jobs? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just something new every time. So yeah. it's really just spontaneous, <laughs> and you get to be flexible with it. Right. Right. That's very, that's very exciting. Uh, you, as you said, you're a filmmaker yourself. Talk about mm -hmm. sort of where we are with filmmaking and the opportunity to make a film and get it shown. Uh, that's always been sort of a challenge for independent filmmakers, and you guys uh, do a lot of work to try to make that happen. Well, I think that's um, the greatest joy of having this platform mm -hmm. is uh, because we know a lot of filmmakers, and, um, and in terms of getting into a festival, uh, it's really difficult. Yeah, it's, it's really it's, hard to it's do. It's hard right? to do. Yeah. Um, and so providing that platform for filmmakers is uh, like a joy for us, but also to be able to um, work even year round, because even though the festival happens uh, once a year, mm -hmm. uh, we often have workshops and um, other types of opportunities for filmmakers to come together and um, either work together or um, or learn uh -huh. about the industry and actually uh, Zach was our emerging um, film he, he received the emerging filmmaker award last year <laughs> and when he came up with this project with Little Church uh, my husband and I are actually producers on that film as well too yeah so yeah. that relationship continued it wasn't just about the festival but it's about building these relationships so that filmmakers um, can make these connections, as you said, in relationships where we can continue to work together and make right, films together. Right. What made you want to be a filmmaker? As you said, your your dad was a uh, pastor. I kind of fell into it. Yeah. Um, I started off doing poetry, and um, I wanted to make visuals to go along with my poetry. Mm -hmm. And so I worked on the first project, which was like based around Detroit. And once I picked up a camera, I pretty much never put it down. Yeah. So yeah, I, I fell into it. Um, I wish I found out about it earlier in life. <laughs> but, um, was it something that you you feel like you learned by doing uh, and doing over and over, or did you have a lot of sort of formal training for it? Uh, no formal training, uh, really. Um, I did learn by doing, mm -hmm. um, but I did work with a production company uh, called MVP Collaborative there in Madison Heights, and they taught me a lot, like on the technical side, how to be a professional. Yeah. Um, so uh, that uh, time was very valuable yeah. to my career. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we heard in the short clip of the film about uh, Rosa Parks was that she was a rebellious person uh, her whole life. <laughs> That's why I think what they said even when she was a child, something I don't think most people necessarily know. Can you talk about sort of how you saw that as someone who was close to her? Well. She was quiet spoken, mm -hmm. very quiet. But you knew when she said something what she meant. <laughs> right. Never raised a voice, mm -hmm. didn't have to. She was stern in what she said. Uh -huh. She have told me stories mm -hmm. about things that happened in the South. Yeah. And she believed you should know where you came from. Right. And she was very knowledgeable mm -hmm. of what was going on in the South. Yeah. And when she said she was tired, I can understand why. Yeah. Uh, tired, not young, just... Uh, oh, no, not, not physical. Right. But tired, tired of the way of, being treated the way right. you're being treated. Yeah. A lot of people think her feet was... Her, yeah. None of that is true. No, this was... She was lie. really... Right. This, and that was the day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. You know, she just got fed up. Yeah. And, um, but I can see... I could see it in her, yeah. and like different stories it was told um, when she was younger. I could, and it comes from, I imagine, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, mm -hmm. her grandfather, who was very stern and mm -hmm. wasn't nobody going to come in his house right, right. and mess with none of 
his kids people, sure. or his grandkids. Yeah. I mean, he was stern. So being around him, I think they all yeah. received that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tell me how you identify the films that you want to get into the festival. How do you find Oh, them? wow. It's so tough. <laughs> it's, it's, and we get, because we get a lot of great content. And, um, uh, and so... Uh, through this uh, selection process, um, we watch a lot of films, and our target this year was 45 films, wow. and we have 70. And you end up with 70. And it's 70, and so and we so we I think we have something across the board that everyone will enjoy. Every everything from action to the documentaries and um, from feature films to the short films. I think we have something for everyone. Yeah, yeah. And and with our signature events uh, as well too, with the film fashion. Right, you music. have uh, these other you have the, these other events, the panel discussion. Uh, Absolutely. Like that. And one of the highlights, I think, this year is uh, the fact that we have um, Brian Smiley, uh -huh. who is the um, vice president of production for Sony Columbia Pictures, hmm. that is going to be there on August 9th and to share his experience and expertise about um, production and distribution in the film industry. Yeah, yeah an important end of it as well. Uh, Evan, I'm going to end with you. Tell me, do you want to continue to be an actor? Do you want to grow up to be an actor? Or is this something you're just doing for fun? Um, well... At, for acting, acting for me is like, right now, mm -hmm. it's, it's something I want to I wanna continue to do. Cause yeah. Not only is it fun, it's like, <laughs> like to me, I don't know if it's like really the case, but most jobs or other jobs, it's uh -huh. kind of like, it's one specific thing that you're, you're going for, that yeah. you're um, working to. And acting is... Like I, I want to keep doing it because it's so free. Like because, because it's I different can. Different all the time. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, that's really. Yeah, great. so I think I want to yeah. continue to act. Yeah. All right. Well, we will look for you on the big screen. Uh, congratulations again on the festival, and congratulations Thank you so much. to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, a Detroit artist draws on the city's diversity for her projects. But first, we're going to continue our look back at this program over the last 50 years. Here's an American Black Journal interview from 2000 about black filmmakers in Hollywood. We talked about this blackout in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Is starting a production company the only way black writers, producers, and directors can get a fair shake in Hollywood? Is that a fair statement in 2000? Well, I guess it goes back to Mr. Jackson's quote about doing it yourself. You have to control it. And the only way to really control is to have a company that owns it. And that's what we, I think we need to understand. African Americans are entrepreneurs. We, we understand that. And entrepreneurship is owning a production company in our field. And by owning the production company, you can control the product that you put out. And that's you know, basically how it works. Um, it, it, we're looking for opportunities. I know we look for people to give us things, and we deserve those things. But the reality is that we don't get them. So the only way to get it is to produce it yourself. And that's one reason why we formed Flower Girl Productions, is because the stories that we want to tell. Um, I'm a writer, he's a writer, but you know, we can go pitch our stories to a hundred different people. What if they don't buy them? Mm -hmm. Then they don't get done. That's, you know, that makes no sense for me not to get stuff done because someone says, I'm not going to give you the money to do it, so then I have to do it myself, and we have to do it ourselves. And that's just the way it works in, um, in Hollywood and film production. <laughs> Local artist is telling Detroit's, Detroit story in a unique way. Donna Jackson has created a traveling exhibition that displays the creativity and opportunities available in Detroit for artists. Her projects are also inspired by the city's diversity and her experiences as an African-American woman. Detroit Performs has her story. I never saw myself as a person that was an artist to create art for others to enjoy. That wasn't the point. The point was for me to get to know who I was. I was in Houston from 05 to 2010. I was hearing so much about the insurgence and the change of Detroit. And I was seeing all these different faces of who's doing this, these transitions and all that. And none of them looked like me or my friends or, or my neighborhood, none of it. Like, I need to create something 
to make sure people, these voices that I know that are there are, can be heard, seen, and people are aware of it. And that's what I started doing as project manager. I wanted to reach out to other artists. Door of Opportunity is a transition of physical doors into art. And I wanted to make sure that the collection we got was this really good mix of what was really going on in Detroit with artists. With these doors, you can do a few things. You get a voice, you get your artwork in the communities where it truly, truly matters. And then you also get to engage with other artists that may feel the same way that you do. Today, we're installing uh, Doors of Opportunity in Bates Academy. I love that it is a school and a system that I grew up in. And being able to do that and bring art to that school is, is, is really exciting. It is a process, and it's one we had to learn. We learned that we needed team members, we needed movers, we needed people that understood the delicacy of art. The theme was uh, Detroit. We all really do see this city in a different way, so it's so important to uh, give someone that chance to show that. We always go to diversity, meaning skin color or gender. No, I mean, thought process and experience diversifies us, right? And we need to really give that more power or value it more, and I think that's what I try to do with my projects. What I hope the students get from the installation is knowing that you can make a career out of being an artist, that art is something that should be a normal part of your everyday life and space, and seeing art made by people that are from the same city as you and most likely look like you. you know, I think those are important. I think people see me more as that person that develops projects that supports exhibits and support other artists and i'm good with that title it's not until you really get to know me that i may share my art my personal art colorful women is my personal art series that i have been doing since 2005. i I am very good at being a human being. <laughs> I am very good at being a spiritual being. I am eh, in, 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 about being a woman. It's, it's one of those kind of weaknesses that I have that I'm trying to work on, being comfortable in my skin as a woman. And I have nieces and nephews, and, and I want them to be comfortable in their skin in that same way, whether they're male, female, or whatever they're feeling. I started drawing women, kind of deconstructing them from what the standard beauties is for America and constructing it in a way that was more digestible for me. I almost think I'm trying to make the physical woman into a spiritual one by the way I draw. And the funny thing is I called it Colorful Women, but when I first started, I only drew in black and white because color scared the hell out of me. But as I continue, you know, I think art calls you and tells you what to do. And so the colors start kind of just phasing into it. I started seeing small sentences just occurring in my illustrations. And then it went from small sentences to like paragraphs, like, oh, maybe I need to, you know, look into just sitting and writing uh, and seeing what that feels like. A lot of time the inspiration to write is listening to other people, their stories of being women, our own experiences in the neighborhood, experience with family, pretty much anything could spark that inspiration. It is a lifestyle of doing something creative every day. Great story. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. You can get more information about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org, and you can always connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time.
American Black Journal is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marilad cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929.